Thank you so much, Zoe, for that very generous introduction. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you all so much for coming. I look forward to talking with you, and I look forward very much to your questions and comments uh, at the end. So when an agent or an organization discriminates against someone in a manner and in a context in which that discrimination seems wrong or unfair, how are we best to conceptualize that unfairness? Is it an injustice, a violation of the victim's rights? Or is it a mere misfortune? That is to say, an unfortunate state of affairs that it would be good to rectify, but one in which the victim really has no claim of justice to have it rectified. This distinction, I want to say, I borrow from a philosopher who influenced John Rawls a lot. Her name was Judith Sklar. She was a politi political theorist at Harvard for many years. And she distinguished between injustices and then this other thing, rather than just calling it something that wasn't an injustice, she said we can think of it as a misfortune. And the distinguishing characteristic is that in cases of mere misfortune, there is something bad happening. There is a group that's disadvantaged. Um, but they have no claim of justice on others to have that disadvantage rectified. If it is an injustice, if wrongful discrimination is an injustice, what kind of injustice is it? Is it something akin to the kinds of injustices that public law attempts to prevent and to rectify? Either a violation of our shared public mores or an injustice against society at large. Or is it clo something closer to a private law wrong, a wrong done by one individual to another, where the wrongdoer A violates some kind of right that's personal to the victim B, and as a result owes something to B by way of rectification or compensation? I think the answer is actually both, and I'll elaborate that in my conclusion. But I approach discrimination from the standpoint of Anglo-American philosophy. I work as a philosopher trying to think about what makes it unfair. And many of the currently popular philosophical theories of why discrimination is wrong or unfair focus primarily on the public law dimension, on the social side of things. So in this lecture, I want to focus primarily on the personal wrong. And I want to take you through some ways in which I think discrimination is tort-like and specifically akin to the tort of negligence. So before I go, if you're following along with my lecture on the handout, before I move on to section A, I want to talk just a little bit about discrimination law and about some of the currently popular philosophical theories of discrimination, and this is not on the handout. So the earliest anti-discrimination laws in Canada that were enacted after World War II in the late 1940s approached discrimination in nothing like a tort-like manner. It, these were regarded as a form of quasi-criminal law. They treated discrimination as an offense, usually involving racial or religious discrimination with animus, a kind of deep prejudice against the group that was being excluded. Um, and it was assumed this would be dealt with by the police and brought through something like the criminal justice system. The primary focus was on the animus with which the discriminator acted. It wasn't primarily on the amelioration of the social conditions in which victims or discriminatees live and work. Obviously, that has changed since then with the development of provincial and our federal human rights codes. Discrimination is no longer regarded as a quasi-criminal matter, but it has a kind of unclear amorphous status. There are elements that seem to belong in public law, and as I'm going to argue, elements that suggest that there's some kind of private wrong at issue here. Now, over the past 10 to 15 years, there's been a sudden surge in philosophical interest in discrimination. Um, it's a wonderful and very young field to work in, and it's really odd because when I first started working in this area, um, oh, am I supposed to not to stray apart from the camera? Is that right? When I first started working in this, in this area, um, there was virtually nobody doing philosophical work on discrimination. There was a huge legal literature from within particular jurisdictions. So there was a lot written within Canada, both on how to interpret discrimination under the charter, if we're looking at Section 15 equality rights, on how to think about 
private sector anti-discrimination law under the codes. There's obviously a huge literature in the United States, both on Title VII and on the 14th Amendment, and similarly in the UK and EU human rights law. But there, philosophers didn't seem to regard it as an interesting question at all. I have some theories about that, but I don't get to go into them with you right now, though if you're curious, you can ask me during the discussion period. Um, but suddenly now, I think philosophers have begun to take seriously the idea that there's something deeply perplexing and troubling here, not just because of the moral urgency of claims uh, that discrimination has occurred and need to be rectified, but also because, as I'll talk later, discrimination seems to involve so many disparate sorts of problems. Obviously, as you know, there can be discrimination on a whole variety of different grounds, race, sex, gender identity, um, religion, disability, and it's, it's not clear what all of those share, but also because it now, we now think of discrimination in a broader way as involving not just acts that deliberately or facially exclude others, but also a whole variety of policies that are neutral and have the unintended effect of disproportionately disadvantaging certain groups. But interestingly, much of the recent philosophical literature on discrimination focuses on the public law dimension of it. So those of you who have read Taranab Kaitan's work, he's a philosopher writing from the UK, he's developed a group-based sufficientarian theory according to which discrimination is wrong because it fails to eliminate certain persistent disadvantages suffered by particular underprivileged social groups and so it leaves these groups without the conditions necessary for positive freedom or autonomy. Um, even more recently, Joey Fishkin in the US has uh, defended what he calls the bottleneck theory of discrimination, according to which discrimination is wrong because it creates what he calls a bottleneck, a, uh, an area through which it's hard for certain individuals from certain groups to pass. Those people just end up lacking opportunities that are readily available to the rest of us. Um, there are other theorists who focus less on disadvantage, the way Kaitan and Fish can do, and more on things like stereotyping of particular groups, or the creation and perpetuation of social hierarchies, the way in which certain groups, through persistent forms of discrimination, end up being treated as second-class citizens with a lower social status. Now, a lot of these theories work particularly well for cases of indirect discrimination, though. That is to say, cases where there's a practice or a rule that's facially neutral, it doesn't explicitly classify people on the basis of a prohibited ground of discrimination, and it doesn't even usually classify them on the basis of some trait that's so closely tied to a prohibited ground that we'd say it's really just a proxy for that ground. Um, it's just a policy that has a disproportionately disadvantageous impact on a group marked out by a prohibited ground. An example I often use is the old rule that the RCMP used to have, that Mounties had to wear the Stetson hat, that, that big cowboy-like hat, for formal ceremonies. Obviously, it's impossible to wear this hat and to wear a turban and a variety of other sorts of religious attire at the same time. So this was viewed as indirect discrimination uh, on the ground of religion. When we look at those sorts of cases of discrimination, it does seem that the real problem is that there's a whole group of people that has been excluded, marginalized, stereotyped, but it's hard to think that one person there has been wronged or had some kind of right violated. So if, if that's our model, it starts to look like really discrimination is just what I earlier called a mere misfortune as opposed to an injustice and certainly not the kind of personal injustice that something like tort law is concerned with. So I think it's true that discrimination law does aim in part at redistributing important resources and opportunities um, and that it cares about eliminating things like stereotypes and social hierarchy and I'll talk more about that in my conclusion but I want in the bulk of this lecture to suggest that there are some important dimensions of anti-discrimination law that aren't captured by a theory that focuses exclusively on these sorts of issues of redistribution, social hierarchy, disadvantage and so on. I want to try and persuade you that sometimes, at least, the wrong of discrimination is more often tort-like and it's akin to the tort of negligence. So I'm going to draw your attention to, and now we're going back to the handout, A, features that make discrimination look like a tort, and then B, in particular, 
features that make discrimination look like the tort of negligence. Um, but again, I want to emphasize, I'm not trying to suggest that this is all there is to discrimination. My own view is a pluralist one, and I'll say something about what my own view is at the end of the lecture. Okay, moving on to section A on the handout. Features that make discrimination look like a tort. So I want to start by calling your attention to several structural features of anti-discrimination law, which, at least if taken at face value, suggest that in many cases of discrimination, a personal wrong is, has been done by the discriminator to the discriminatee, a wrong that violates this person's right to a certain tr treatment and gives him a claim against the discriminator for rectification. So one on the handout, the complete model. In Canada, our human rights codes work for the most part through a kind of complete model where claimants bring claims against alleged discriminators, alleging that they've been harmed in a way that entitles them legally to compensation. And relatedly, among the most important, not exclusive, but uh, among the most important remedies are compensatory damages. So for instance, in the Ontario Human Rights Code, tribunals can issue an order directing the party who infringed a person's right to pay monetary compensation to that party for loss arising out of the infringement, including compensation for injury to dignity, feelings, and self-respect. Uh, they can also make an order directing that party to make restitution to the other party other than through monetary compensation. So this suggests that at least one of the important injustices that is involved in cases of discrimination is of some kind of personal injustice or wrong done to the discriminatee. Moreover, this is three on the handout, it's significant that under much of our legislation, it's the discriminator who has to cover the costs of accommodating the victim. So we don't, we could, but we don't, invite discriminatees just to appeal to some kind of public fund to give them the funds to cover the costs of eliminating discrimination or accommodating their needs. Um, and I think it's significant that this is true even in cases of indirect discrimination. So for instance, cases where an organization has a test for promotion that we find over time is failed in disproportionate numbers by women or certain racial minorities. Cases where there's no malice, there's no intent to harm on the part of the employer. Um, even in these cases, we hold the discriminator, the employer, responsible for the costs of investigating alternative tests, figuring out which one works best, and implementing these tests. Now, I want to deal with an objection to this, which I've listed on the handout. So what I've said on the handout is, well, this, this, these structural features of discrimination law, these are just an effective means of rectifying what's really a problem of distributive justice, a broader social problem. They don't tell us anything about the moral truth involved in discrimination and what makes it wrong. This is the kind of objection that's recently been articulated by John Gardner, a British legal philosopher. He's written a lot on discrimination, but he's in the process of drafting a, new, a whole book now about his views on discrimination. And he has a rather ingenious explanation for all of what I've tried to show you looks tort-like. He says, well, really, this is just the most economically efficient way to deal with what is really just a response to an ordinary kind of social misfortune, a pressing social problem. Namely, there are lots of disadvantaged social groups. We need resources redistributed to these particular groups. It's to our advantage, Gardner says, as the state, to make people think that discrimination is a malum, what's called a malum in se, something that's an evil or wrong in itself. But really, it's just a malum prohibitum, something that becomes legally wrong when we collectively decide that it is and make laws prohibiting it. Moreover, um, we structure the law so that the discriminatee appears to be bringing a claim based on a wrong done to her by the discriminator, but really, that's just the best way to incentivize victims of discrimination to ferret out harmful discriminatory practices, right? It's better for them to think that there's a wrong done to them so that they'll actually bring this apparent wrong before the tribunal, who will then be in a good position to fix it. Moreover, if we require discriminators to cover the costs of accommodating, uh, victims of discrimination, this is really the best way to ensure that they do their research from the beginning and come up with proper policies so that we don't have to go through uh, the adjudication process in the first place. 
So Gardner's view is this is really, there's, no, there's nothing essentially wrong here, and in particular, there's nothing wrong that has the structure of a tort. Um, but I think before we adopt this kind of debunking explanation, we need to see whether we can make sense of this legal structure as reflecting something like the moral truth. Certainly, I want to say, it reflects our moral intuitions about discrimination. Discrimination is quite special as a wrong in that it seems to be a kind of injustice that's particularly serious from a moral standpoint. More serious, actually, than just failing to redistribute resources in the right kind of way, or failing to increase someone's opportunities, or failing to help them out when they've encountered a bottleneck. And generally, I think we do think, at least take, taking the moral context and leaving aside the legal context for a minute, I think we often do think that in cases of discrimination, the victim has been in some way personally insulted or personally wronged, um, even in cases where there's no animus on the part of the discriminator. So I think it's preferable to see whether a sound theory can explain why this is and to take these at face value unless we're given a good reason to think otherwise before turning immediately to Gardner's kind of debunking explanation. Okay, moving on now to part B. Why might we think that discrimination looks specifically like negligence? Um, I want to talk first about the Canadian model of discrimination because I think it's easiest to see uh, discrimination as a form of negligence if we look at the Canadian model and then I'll talk more briefly about other models and we can talk further during our discussion period. So although I've been referring to direct discrimination and indirect discrimination separately, the Canadian Supreme Court has held that when a claimant is trying to bring forward their claim of discrimination and a tribunal or a court is in the process of assessing whether this is really unjustified discrimination, um, that tribunal or court should adopt the same approach regardless of the type of discrimination. This was in a case called Mayorin. Um, so first the claimant has to prove that the rule or practice treats her differently on the basis of some prohibited ground of discrimination. And then the onus shifts to the discriminator to show that the rule is something like what we call a BFR, a bona fide requirement, which involves showing that they adopted the rule for a purpose rationally connected to the job, that they adopted it in good faith in the belief that it was necessary, and that it is in fact reasonably necessary in relation to some work-related purpose that's legitimate. Now, this is the important part for the purposes of my argument. How is a tribunal or a court supposed to decide whether some rule is reasonably necessary in relation to some legitimate work-related purpose? Well, in Canada, we hold that it, it's only necessary if there's no way to accommodate people who possess a certain trait um, without imposing undue hardship upon the employer. So what does this approach to discrimination imply? Well, it effectively suggests, I think, that discrimination amounts to, or wrongful discrimination, amounts to an unreasonable failure to change your rule or practice in circumstances where there are alternatives that would not impose this particular disadvantage on the discriminatee and would serve your purpose equally well. So this is significant because it means that the wrong of discrimination isn't just any classification or mere disadvantage. What's impermissible is classifying people on the basis of some prohibited ground or trait in circumstances where this is unreasonable because there's some way that you could change the rule or adopt a different rule so as to accommodate these people and others like them. We can therefore say that those who discriminate where this is impermissible are acting unreasonably. So the, there's a very straightforward way in which even if the discriminator is not acting with malice or out of animus, and even if they're unaware of their, the effects of their act or policy on the discriminatee, we can still say they're negligent, they acted unreasonably. Now, I understand that some of you may have read a paper of mine called the moral seriousness of indirect discrimination. And I, I give a slightly different argument there, you'll have noted. I argue that in the case of both direct discrimination and indirect discrimination, we can think of the wrongful discrimination as unreasonable in the specific sense that 
you failed to do what you would have done if you had given the discriminatee's interests the right sort of weight in your deliberations, if you had really treated these people as equals. Um, so unreasonableness there, I argue, isn't just failing to accommodate people when you could have, it's failing to accommodate them in circumstances where this is necessary to treat them as an equal. So that's the Canadian model. There are, of course, other models that don't place so much emphasis on building into the very idea of discrimination, the idea of a failure to accommodate. So the model uh, that's prevalent in the UK, that's laid out in the UK's Equality Act, is one of these. Um, I've listed this on the handout here. Um, in the UK, direct discrimination is defined as A, treating B differently because of a trait that's a prohibited ground of discrimination, where this isn't a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. This is my summary of their definition, obviously. And indirect discrimination is a case in which A uses a rule that puts or would put B and others who possess some trait at a disadvantage relative to those who do not possess it, where this trait is a prohibited ground of discrimination and the rule isn't a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. Obviously, there are some di important differences between the UK and the Canadian approach, um, not just the separation of discrimination into these two different forms, but also the idea that in the UK it's more often thought of as the discriminator's reasons that you're assessing in cases of direct discrimination and the rule that you're assessing in cases of indirect discrimination. And of course, there's less emphasis on accommodation up to the point of undue hardship. But I think we can still see discrimination as unreasonable, uh, according to these two definitions, for the same sorts of reasons that I sketched out a minute ago. Whether something is going to be a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim on the UK approach depends in part on the available alternatives and on whether they would impose this kind of disadvantage on the claimant without unduly burdening the discriminator. So once again, I think we can see discrimination as a kind of unreasonable failure to change your rule or practice, um, in part which, which has been left in place because you failed to give the disadvantage or situation of this group the right sort of weight in your deliberations. So that's the, uh, the beginnings of an argument here. Now I want to flesh out the argument that we can think of discrimination as something akin to negligence by considering and trying to respond to um, a number of different objections, which I've just uninspiringly listed as objections one, two, three, and four. Um, so objection one. Um, I can imagine someone saying, and in fact people have said this to me, look, this is just a t whatever this is that you're talking about in discrimination law, this is a totally different form of negligence from what's at issue in tort law, uh, as all of you will probably realize from having studied tort law. So in tort law, the defendant negligently creates a risk of harm to some separate and prior interest, an interest in bodily integrity, an interest in being free from emotional distress, and so on. Obviously, in discrimination law, negligence is not the unreasonable creation of a risk. It's, what is it? Well, it's simply, in a sense, failing to treat you as an equal when I ought to have. So I want to say, yes, of course it's different. I'm, I'm, when I claim that discrimination is a form of negligence, I'm not claiming it's exactly like negligence as we understand it in tort law. The reason they're different is because there are different interests at stake. So it's true that negligence in discrimination isn't the unreasonable creation of a risk that then uh, interferes with or harms some separate and prior interest in bodily or emotional integrity, but that just reflects the different nature of this particular wrong that's at issue in discrimination law. Negligence here is still unreasonably failing to do something, namely change your rule or policy, in circumstances where this causes harm to a recognized interest of the discriminati, here it's an interest in being treated as an equal. But then I can imagine someone saying, look, this really obscures the difference between direct discrimination and indirect discrimination, and it mischaracterizes both of these. Um, this is my objector still talking now. The objector might say, look, in cases of direct discrimination, the problem really lies in the discriminator's own reasons and intent. The problem isn't about the effects on the discriminatee. 
And your idea that what's primarily wrong with discrimination has to do with negligence obscures that. Uh, we're led to focus much more on the effects on possible alternative policies and less on evaluating the discriminator's own reasons. By contrast, in cases of indirect discrimination, um, this is my objector talking again, we really seem just to hold people responsible for the effects of their action, for what they have caused. So it's much closer to something like strict liability. So I want to reject this attempt to, to draw a deep distinction between direct discrimination on the one hand and indirect discrimination on the other and to suggest that what's really going on in direct discrimination is a problem with the discriminator's reasons and what's really problematic about indirect discrimination is somehow the effect, just the effects in distinction from the reasons of the discriminator. So I want to start by noting that in cases of direct discrimination, um, we're not really concerned with the intent with which the discriminator acted. We're concerned with the fact in the world that their act affected a particular person or group because of their possession of a particular trait. And although it's true that the discriminator's intent and motive might be relevant at the stage of the remedy, um, there are certain aggravated damages available and other sorts of remedies in cases where, in particular, where the discriminator has acted out of animus. There can certainly be lots of cases of discrimination that are done without malice or prejudice or even without an intent to cause harm. One of my favorite examples of direct discrimination, which I feel does a good job of, of um, preventing us from thinking of direct discrimination as so very far away from indirect discrimination um, is the following, um, and there, were, there have been several cases of this both in the UK and in the US. You can imagine some kind of recreational community center um, where there are various clientele of the center and there are racial tensions between the different groups who come to the community center. So in an F, the community center's board meets, they try and put their heads together to think what they could do, what sort of policies they could adopt to minimize these racial tensions. And they decide that really the only thing they can do under the circumstances is to have different opening hours for different racial groups. So they post a large sign on the door that says, you know, Latinos, 4 to 6 p.m., blacks, 6 to 8 p.m. Now, this is still direct discrimination. And you can probably think of many reasons why it's objectionable. But it's not objectionable because it was enacted out of malice or prejudice or an intent to harm. It's maybe a somewhat misguided attempt, but it's nevertheless an attempt to quell the tensions between these racial groups. Um, so in order to explain what's wrong with that kind of case of direct discrimination, we can't look to the reasons of the board um, or to something like motive or intent. As for the other part of the puzzle, indirect discrimination, um, is not just concerned with disadvantageous effects of people's actions. It must be the case that there are alternative policies available that would have accommodated someone in order for a particular rule or policy to count as wrongful indirect discrimination. And I think that what we're saying when we, in, as a matter of law, treat something as wrongful or unfair indirect discrimination is, look, it was unreasonable of you, the discriminator, not to have pursued these alternatives or investigated them. Yeah. So if I'm right, then it seems as though both direct and indirect discrimination can be thought to involve a certain kind of unreasonableness, a, a failure to implement or to properly investigate certain kinds of alternative policies that might impose less disadvantage on the group identified by the prohibited ground uh, while still enabling you, the discriminator, to pursue your purposes. Okay, on to objection three. Um, but one might say, well, look, this idea that what's wrong in cases of discrimination is a matter of negligence, you, if that were true, you would expect then that the discriminator could exculpate themselves just by showing that they took all reasonable precautions. And in fact, there's no defense 
in discrimination law that I took all reasonable precautions, so therefore this isn't wrongful discrimination. So it's no defense to a claim of discrimination for the discriminator to come forward and say, look, they did their very best job to take precautions to avoid having some sort of disproportionately disadvantageous impact on people marked out by a particular prohibited ground of discrimination. So I want to reply yes, I want to reply yes, that's true, but there are two good explanations for why there isn't such a defense, and they're both consistent with thinking of discrimination as involving a kind of negligence. The first is that under discrimination law, if there is no alternative policy that would accommodate the discriminatee without causing you, the discriminator, undue hardship, then the policy will be found to be a bona fide requirement and it will be found non-discriminatory. So this means that the only circumstances in which you'll be found to have impermissibly discriminated are ones where there is a viable alternative. And the law supposes that as an employer or as a provider of goods and services, you ought to have located this viable alternative. So although there's no explicit defense of absence of fault, I think it's true that you'll only be held responsible for discrimination in circumstances where really you ought to have known better. Then secondly, I note that discrimination law imposes a duty of non-discrimination only on individuals and entities that have in some sense entered the public sphere. So discrimination law in the private sector all across Canada um, is limited, the, the prohibitions on discrimination are limited to certain specific contexts. You need to be an employer or you need to be engaged in the provision of goods and services to the public or the provision of accommodation. This is all, uh, we can say that part of what these contexts share is that the people in these contexts have in a sense stepped into the public sphere um, they're in charge of the distribution of certain important opportunities and they see themselves as working for the public. I think we can say that it's reasonable to expect that if you enter the public sphere in this way, you ought to know about things like the history of social exclusion of certain groups. You need to be especially vigilant for the disadvantages or the disproportionate disadvantages that your policies might impose on members of certain persistently disadvantaged groups. And then I might add, it also makes sense given the public interest dimension of discrimination law that we wouldn't have an explicit defense of uh, having taken all reasonable precautions. Obviously, as I'm gonna mention a little later on, one of the other aims of discrimination law is to redistribute important opportunities to those who are less privileged. And obviously it would interfere with these particular public interest aims uh, to have a defense of taking all reasonable precautions that would enable employers to frustrate these other goals. Lastly, objection four. Um, let's suppose that it is true that some employers or providers of goods and services really couldn't have known in advance that their policy would have certain implications on certain employees or discriminatees. Um, this is what Goldberg and Zipersky call compliance luck. So it's luck not just in how things turn out in the world, but luck in whether these particular discriminators are able to comply with anti-discrimination law. The worry is that through no lack of diligence on their part, they just might not have had access to the relevant information, the relevant knowledge of alternatives, knowledge about the impact on this particular group. Um, so they might not be able to comply, but that's through no lack of fault on their part. So I have two replies to this worry. The first is that Negligence in tort law is also subject to compliance luck. So although there might be a problem here with compliance luck, it's not a unique problem with the wrong of discrimination, and it's no reason for thinking that there's a disanalogy between discrimination law and negligence law, since liability in negligence law also depends on compliance luck. As you'll know from your torts class, if you're a student here, negligence law also holds everyone, everyone to the standard of the reasonable person, um, with a few exceptions. Um, 
even if this particular person couldn't possibly reach that standard, so if we have a competent adult who seems to possess the relevant um, ratiocinative capacities and the relevant moral capacities to think of himself as somebody who could be held under, a, who could stand under a duty of care, this person is held to the standard of the reasonable person, even if given their particular makeup, their particular character traits, their moodiness that morning, or their level of intelligence, um, it's not in fact true that they could actually have reached that standard. Um, and so discrimination law is no different. Um, I recently talked about my views of discrimination and this idea that discrimination involves a kind of negligence at, at Fordham, University and the faculty there ended up pressing me for the longest time on this particular point. They were very concerned that this suggestion uh, would leave a lot of employers looking as though they were somehow at fault when really they're not. Really, there's nothing they could have done. They had done every possible investigation that they could. Um, so and I, I guess at the end of the day, I had a couple of responses to this. The first is just that I'm inclined to think this is an, un, this is an exaggerated worry. Um, in the, this particular era of the internet where there's a great deal of shared knowledge within particular realms of employment, within particular industries, about the impact of certain kinds of policies on certain groups, it seems to me that uh, there's a lot of information that's shared between employers, between providers of goods and services, and there's certainly a lot out there in the media about the impact of certain kinds of policies on certain groups. So it seems to me that the, the worry that we're going to be putting lots of employers in the position where somehow they're being held to be at fault when really there's nothing else they could have done seems to me a bit unrealistic. I want to say, look, there is a lot of information out there. Um, and so I worry that this sort of worry is often just a backhanded rationalization for laziness on the part of employers and continuing with the status quo. In any case, then this is the, the remainder of my reply, I'm not actually arguing that we should alter discrimination law in such a way that, as to make it particularly difficult for employers. I'm just suggesting that this is a good interpretation of discrimination law as it is. So if this is a problem, that discrimination law as it is seems to impose too many obligations on employers, then maybe we need to look at that. Okay, I want to now recap briefly what I've talked about so far. I've tried to draw your attention firstly to some structural features of discrimination law, which suggests that it's akin to a personal wrong or the kind of wrong that we try and rectify in tort law, where there's uh, a wrongdoer who has violated some right of the victim, and the victim then has a claim for rectification. And then I've also tried to suggest that discrimination is akin to the tort of negligence in that we can make sense of the idea that the discriminator acted wrongly by acting unreasonably toward the discriminatee. Um, now, of course, in negligence law, and some of you might be wondering about this as a possible further objection. In negligence law, the creation of an unreasonable risk is only treated as a wrong to someone if they're under a duty not to bring about that particular risk toward that group of people in that situation. Um, so obviously, similarly, it's only unreasonable to fail to accommodate a certain group if you have a duty to. And that brings us to the question that is, in a sense, the real question that philosophers like me are trying to answer. What is it that might ground that duty? So now we're moving on to part C on the handout, the anti-discrimination duty. So what is it that might ground a duty not to discriminate? This is really the question, what makes discrimination wrong in the first place? So I want to say a couple of things here. Firstly, I want to say that there are many answers one could give to this question and that my claim about the analogy between discrimination law and negligence law is actually compatible with a wide array of theories about what makes discrimination wrong. So it's possible for you to agree with what I've said up to this point and then to think that the theory that I'm now going to go on to sketch about discrimination and discrimination law is utter bunkum. So you can disagree with the last part of my talk, but still agree with the general message that there are various features of discrimination law that seem to look like uh, tort law and in particular negligence law. 
But now I want to talk about the particular theory that I'm trying to defend in this book that Zoe mentioned that I'm developing, The Many Faces of Inequality. Um, it's a pluralist theory, so that means that what I've been telling you so far today is only part of the story. I've emphasized how discrimination is tort-like, but of course there are many other features of discrimination law that make it look decidedly unlike a response to a personal wrong. Uh, the most obvious of these would include the huge and wide-sweeping remedies in most human rights codes. So most human rights codes include not only backward-looking remedies that are designed to compensate the di discriminatee for some kind of personal wrong, but also forward-looking remedies that are designed to provide assistance to a variety of social groups to ensure that discrimination doesn't occur in the future. So if you look, for instance, at Ontario's Human Rights Code, you'll see an enormous array of pub what are explicitly called public interest remedies. Tribunals can order changes in hiring practices in the future. They can require employers or providers of goods and services to implement proactive recruitment policies toward members of certain groups. They can require organizations to implement education programs. They can even require organizations to make donations to charities of a sort that they specify. So these are all forward-looking and their aim is clearly educative and redistributive. So then you might be asking yourself, well, how then could discrimination both be tort-like and be the kind of injustice that these sorts of more forward-looking, more public interest-based remedies are an appropriate response to? Well, I think it can, because I think discrimination is actually wrong for a number of different reasons that can sometimes operate in different cases, but sometimes can be operative in one in the same case. And I think some of these reasons account for the more private law-like structure of parts of discrimination law, whereas other reasons really push us toward thinking of the wrong in a more public interest-based way. So I want to talk a little bit about these. And this, this list of three is not meant to be an exclusive list, but it's the three that I am most interested in and that I think we can see operative in the case law uh, and that I focus on in my book. And these are listed, again, inspiringly as one, two, and three on the handout. So firstly, uh, sometimes discrimination seems to be wrong because it subordinates some people to others treating them as second-class citizens. Um, I'm sure you can all think of cases of discrimination of which this is true. Obviously, the most heinous examples are things like the Jim Crow laws in the American South that quite literally marked off blacks as second-class citizens deserving of second-class facilities. Secondly, though, sometimes discrimination denies some people deliberative freedoms in circumstances where this leaves them unable to see themselves as equal participants in society. I have a theory about certain kinds of freedoms which I call deliberative freedoms. They're basically the freedom to think about what you're going to do and choose your own plan for your life without having to factor in constantly other people's assumptions about certain traits of yours, like your gender and what a person of your gender ought to be doing, or your race and what abilities a person of your race ought to have. Um, obviously, we don't, we don't always have such freedoms, nor ought we to, but I want to argue that we have them in circumstances where that's necessary to see ourselves as an equal participant in society. So, for instance, I don't have a right to have you cover the cost of my religious pilgrimage that I think is necessary, even though if you don't cover that cost, that's going to impinge on my autonomy or my freedom. But we do think that I have the right to be able to practice my religion and hold down a job, even if that means that you as my employer need to give me a more flexible work schedule so that I can pray at the times of day that I'm required to. So obviously it's a very difficult task to specify when a person has a right to one of these deliberative freedoms and when they don't, but my thought is that they do when it's necessary you know, for them to have that right if they're going to see themselves as a full and equal participant in society. And you can see how thinking about this particular problem when people are denied deliberative freedoms in circumstances when they have a right to 
can, can easily uh, make, help us make sense of the idea that discrimination is a personal wrong. If you denied a particular person their deliberative freedom, you, in a circumstances where they have a right to it, you've violated a right of theirs. And then moving on to three on the handout, um, there are also certain cases of discrimination that leave some people without access to basic goods. So goods that are necessary for full and equal participation in the life of a society. Um, if any of you in your constitutional law class have studied the Eldridge case, that's actually a Section 15 charter case, but it's a case where it's, I think it's this kind of claim that's at issue. This involved a claim by people who were hearing impaired um, for funding for interpreters in hospitals. And interestingly, their claim was something like, this is a basic good. This is the kind of good that we need if we're to function as equals in our society. Uh, so in my book, I try and show that these are all quite distinctive sorts of injustices. Um, what I want to mention to you now, what's important for my talk, is that I think they're all, they all have a distinctive structure. And we can think of some of them as giving rise to wrongs that are, look more like private law wrongs and others of them giving rise to wrongs that look more like public law wrongs. So for instance, if you think about the den denial of someone's deliberative freedom, which I mentioned a minute ago, and if you think about subordination in the special sense that expressivists often have in mind when they use this term where subordination means marking someone out as inferior, saying fountain whites and fountain colored. Um, that sort of act of marking or stigmatizing someone as inferior, that seemed, we can plausibly think of that, I want to argue, as giving rise to a personal wrong, and so a personal claim of the victim against the discriminator for rectification. But there are other injustices amongst the three that I've just mentioned here um, that seem to be of a more general social nature where we're concerned with the position of a group rather than a personal wrong done to an individual. So when we talk about some people being subordinated to others, we might be concerned less with the explicit marking out of some one person as inferior and more with the creation or perpetuation in society as a whole of two classes of people, a superior one and an inferior one. Um, a lot of my book is devoted to trying to make sense of this idea of unfair subordination because I think it's really important, but it's clearly a more social idea that relies on this notion that there are identifiable social groups and what's really problematic is that one group is being held to be beneath others. Um, Similarly, leaving a particular group like the hearing impaired without access to a basic good, sign language interpretation in hospitals. That I take too is an instance of a more general social injustice, an injustice against all the members of a particular group. So I think that if we think of discrimination as involving a number of different distinctive sorts of wrongs, um, we can make sense of the puzzling combination of private and public law that discrimination law seems to involve. Um, my theory is unified though, or so I try and argue in my book, because all of these injustices, um, can, we can think of them all as ways of failing to treat others as equals. So the idea is that what unifies all of these different kinds of injustice or these different kinds of wrongs is that they're all ways of failing to treat other people as equals. But what does the moral work in each case of explaining why it's wrong or why it's injustice isn't the abstract idea of equality. It's rather the particular things that I just spoke about the co contribution to social subordination, the fact that someone has been marked out as inferior, the fact that someone's been denied deliberative freedom in circumstances where they have a right, the fact that some group has been denied access to a basic good. Uh, so um, hopefully, uh, this way of thinking about discrimination um, manages to capture the diverse aspects of discrimination, but at the same time, it makes sense of them as a unified whole. So if I'm right, then the theories of discrimination that I started out by mentioning at the start of this lecture, 
Chaitan's theory, which thinks of discrimination as wrong because it denies certain social groups the conditions necessary for autonomy, and Fishkin's theory that thinks of discrimination as wrong because it creates these social bottlenecks. Um, these, um, as I see it, there's something deeply right about these theories. It's just that they don't capture the whole picture. And as I see it, the challenge for us as theorists of discrimination law going forward is actually to develop a pluralist theory. We need one that's rich enough to capture all that seems to be involved in different kinds of cases of unfair discrimination. But we need something that's still coherent and cohesive enough to be worthy of the label of a theory rather than simply to be a list of completely different injustices. Uh, I was trained as a moral philosopher, and one of the most prominent so-called theories of well-being is something that people just unobjectionably call the objective list theory of well-being. And the idea is that your well-being just consists of a number of items on this list, and they're totally diverse. Um, having meaningful and deep relationships with other people, having a successful career, being happy, having children, writing a book, and, so, and the list is very, very long. And obviously critics of this theory have said, this isn't a theory at all, this is just a list, and it's a list of completely different things. So one pitfall that pluralists about discrimination like myself have to try and avoid is, we don't want our theory of discrimination to look like that list which is supposedly a theory of well-being, but ends up just being a list of disparate items. Now, I hope that my explanation that, well, all of these different wrongs that comprise discrimination are really unified because they're all ways of failing to treat people as an equal, I hope that's satisfactory as an explanation of how these things are cohesive. But I really do think we need some kind of similarly pluralist theory to help us make sense of the different ways in which the wrong of discrimination seems to be both a personal wrong done by someone to someone else and also um, to involve, in many cases, broader social injustices. Thanks.